Oh, hi. Didn't see you there. Well, here I am in beautiful Hong Kong, a concrete jungle hi. where dreams are made of. I'm pretty sure that's their tagline. Anyway, if we're in Hong Kong and we're talking Chinese comics, specifically Hong Kong comics, there's one name that's most important, and that's Wong Yuk Long, also known as Tony Wong. And he created just the most manhwa, that's what they call comics here. He's a very fascinating character. Let's get into it. Tony Wong debuted in comics at just 13 years old in 1970 with a comic called Little Rascals, which followed various hoodlums that ran around in the poor tenements of Hong Kong protecting their turf. And it was violent. In 1975, Hong Kong passed the Indecent Publications Law to limit the violence in Manhua at the time. So Tony started a newspaper which wasn't held to the same standards and continued the story there retitling it Oriental Heroes, and toning down the violence somewhat. By 1980, he started his own publishing company, Jademan, and began publishing several titles. Ultimately, this company went public, but then fell on hard times during the Hong Kong stock market crash of 1987. So they turned to the international market, and from 1988 to 1993, Jademan published several titles translated into English. The books were 64 pages because they had so many back issues to pull from. And unlike Japanese comics, they're in full color. Let's try some local comic book shops here in Hong Kong. I'm going to try Metro Comics and Clark's Comics because they're both in the Causeway Bay area that I'm staying at. Okay, so that was a total bust. Those shops were so claustrophobic, they only seemed to really focus on toys and modern day DC, Marvel, and Image Comics. So I'm also kind of close to this free museum called Comics Homebase, which focuses on the Hong Kong comic scene. So let's go there and see if uh, maybe I can luck out there and find a copy of the comic I'm looking for. Comics home base. It's about the history of Manwa here in Hong Kong. Let's go take a look. In the 1970s, and I specifically mentioned. Tony Wong's Little Rogues, also known as Little Rascals. Very important historically. And success! Comics Home Base ended up being the right place to go. They had tons of comics by all sorts of Chinese creators, including Tony Wong in both Chinese and English. So I got Oriental Heroes number one. We're gonna read it, we're gonna review it for the techniques and tropes that Tony Wong and honestly, Chinese comics in general tend to use. But one thing worth noting real quick is that um, this is not the origin, even though it's number one. It was not in common, uncommon, excuse me, for Tony to simply skip the origin and get around to it later at some point with flashbacks because these books are all about action, action, action. Let's get into it. Oriental Heroes focused on two long-lost brothers that found each other when their father passed away, and they ended up running his Kung Fu school together, known as Dragon Tiger Gate. The younger brother is known in English as Tiger Wong, 18 years old. His elder half-brother is known as Dragon Wong and is a bit more of a badass, but he has apparently been killed just before this issue of Oriental Heroes, in which the brothers and their best friend, known as Golden Dragon, had defeated the global cult's boss. Golden Dragon is like a brother to the two, and he helps run the school. They all have different names depending on the translation, but I'm using the ones used here in Oriental Heroes. Let's read through the story and analyze its techniques and tropes. The story kicks off with the global cult's second-in-command, 
Chan O. Wan informing another leader in the organization, Skeleton Secretary, that they have info of Tiger Wong heading to them in Thailand to get revenge for the death of his brother. That's one trope that we should talk about right at the beginning. It can sometimes go from a panel that's got a, an illustrated style to a more painterly style. And this is sort of done to emphasize a story beat, but it can take some getting used to. Tiger Wong lands and is instantly taken to a room by a bunch of corrupt customs agents working for the global cult. They prepare to check his butt for contraband, and Tiger spins on them saying, You think you're man enough to stick your fingers up my ass? You're welcome to try! and his eyes ignite with fire, which intimidates the agents from doing so. It's worth noting that the word your is spelled incorrectly here. There's a lot of little grammar ticks like that that are incorrect throughout the book. Since there's no credited letterer, I think I'm gonna have to blame Tony Wong. I hope he can live with that. The corrupt agents bring out some heroin that they claim is Tiger's, framing him. So he then kicks everyone in the face, literally outruns automatic weapons fire, and jumps out an airport window about three stories high. On the way down, he flips and kicks someone else in the face for the hell of it. I think you could call this extreme action a trope, because that's really what the books are all about, is getting from one action scene to the next. That's what Tony Wong is most interested in doing. He's got a very unique and explosive way of illustrating a kick to the face. He loves it, and I think if he could, he'd have Tiger Wong accomplishing everyday chores with a kick to the face, like, you know, paying his electric bill and going to the grocery store. It would all involve a kick to the face. Tiger jumps in a nearby limo and holds the girl inside hostage, demanding the driver leaves immediately. Tiger accidentally touches her breast, which is sort of played as a joke, and the driver says Tiger's in a lot of trouble because she's the Premier's daughter. He's being tailed by the corrupt Colonel Nikon, a military official who also works for the global cult. But Tiger threatens to throw the girl out of the car, so the military backs off. Tiger tries to be kind by offering her a tissue for her tears, but she blows her nose and throws it at him. The humor in these comics is very broad and often involves bodily functions. It's a trope, but it's also sort of out of place. It'd be like if you were watching Die Hard and every time John McClane killed a terrorist, he let loose a bunch of farts. We still don't know the girl's name, but we keep seeing her thoughts where she observes that Tiger is a master fighter or very handsome. He asks for the busiest place in the area, and she tells him about the farmer's market by the river, where Tiger hopes to lose the military. When Skeleton Secretary learns that Colonel Nikon hasn't captured Tiger, he heads into their dungeon to retrieve a fighter capable of taking Tiger down. And this part is pretty gross. There are two super strong guys being held in chains in a huge pit of what is clearly human waste. One of the prisoners rebels against a guard with a whip, and lifts up a huge weight on his legs, knocking the guard into the poop. Skeleton Secretary lifts the prisoners up and says they ne'er change, which I guess means never change, and offers them early release if they can take down Tiger Wong. Meanwhile, Tiger leaps out of the limo at the farmer's market, disappearing into the crowd. Nikon lands and orders his men to do a house-to-house -house search. Back in Hong Kong, we cut to the Kung Fu temple that Tiger and his late brother ran, along with their friend Golden Dragon. Golden Dragon and his friend Guy are met by the local police commissioner, who tells them where Tiger went. Guy says Thailand is supposed to be fun, and Golden Dragon crosses his eyes. This is the height of comedy. Uh, I once was so desperate for coffee that I went into the shop and had them pour the boiling hot liquid right into my hands since they were out of cups. It was the funniest thing to ever happen at a Starbucks. The commissioner helps Guy and Golden Dragon slip onto an airplane to Thailand, dressed as flight crew. Meanwhile, in Thailand, Tiger is hiding beneath a house with massive rats, waiting until the military stops searching. And here's a trope. Right in the middle of every comic, there was a pull-out poster. Now, I'm going to actually leave mine in, in here so that it's intact, and that this comic stays worth an absolute fortune so that one day I can have a kid and put him through college. Mwah! The military enters the house and asks the old man's granddaughter, Winnie, to check the basement for Tiger, so that they don't have to deal with the rats. She's shocked to see Tiger, but plays it off as being surprised by rats. The military leaves. Skeleton's secretary visits the village and tells Nikon he has one last chance to find Tiger 
before he will take over. Nikon has his men research each house more carefully. Tiger befriends Winnie and her grandfather, and when the military returns, he seems to disappear. When the military leaves, the grandfather looks up in the rafters and sees a hat and umbrella and notes that Tiger can do the shrinking trick. This is a trope worth mentioning. Uh, the comic doesn't go full supernatural with demons and wizards and sorcerers, but it does have Tiger capable of moves that are kind of beyond what a normal person can achieve. And he continues to improve over the course of the story, not unlike something like Dragon Ball or Naruto. Golden Dragon and Guy's plane lands in Malaysia because of a huge typhoon that prevents them from getting all the way to Thailand. Golden Dragon refuses to waste a minute and heads for the nearest marina. Golden Dragon doesn't wait for anything. This is the kind of guy that would go to a McDonald's, make an order, and if it isn't within his hands within that minute, he starts complaining loudly to absolutely everybody about how terrible the service is. Golden Dragon talks to a fisherman, offering double and then five times the normal rental rate to go to Thailand through the storm. The fisherman refuses, but then says he can find a sailor for $5,000 American. Golden Dragon agrees and says to take him to this man, and the fisherman says, it's him! This is so funny that obviously Golden Dragon crosses his eyes again. The ship heads out into the storm, but they spot some pirates and another boat in the distance. The pirate is led by a man named Jaw. He has sharp teeth. Get it? Jaw literally punches right through the first man that tries to fight back. Like I said, the violence in this comic can be quite extreme. It's so over the top that it's kind of funny, but I probably wouldn't let a young kid read this book. Jaw then has all the women stripped and brings them aboard his ship to sell into slavery. It's pretty dark stuff, but it escalates even more when he tosses one of the women into the sea to be eaten by sharks just to show what will happen if anyone resists. Jaw then sinks the boat with the remaining men, and Golden Dragon insists they must save them. But before that happens, the pirates spot Golden Dragon's boat and begin pursuing it. Jaw is seen raping one of the women, and he orders his men to capture the boat. The pirate ship is gaining on the small fishing vessel, so Golden Dragon tosses gasoline and lights it up with a flare gun. But Jaw and his pirates maneuver through and crash into the fishing boat. That's where we leave their story, cutting back to Thailand. Skeleton's secretary declares he's taking over the hunt for Tiger Wong, and Tiger befriends Winnie and her grandfather, and they decide to eat. Tiger offers to pay, but the old man is too proud and heads into the village to sell his radio, one of his few possessions. Tiger slips out to follow. In the village, the old man tries to sell his radio to several people for an increasingly small amount of bots, Thailand's currency. And then comes my favorite typo. After starting at 200 bots, he ends up at someone where he asks, do me a favor, 140 bats, okay? It's just a simple switch of the T and the H, but I love the idea of someone asking for 140 bats. I mean, would those be 140 baths in a row, or on consecutive days? Either way, it actually sounds like it could get painful. Tiger puts on a hat and offers 200 bots for the radio, saving the old man's pride. But when the old man starts to thank Tiger, the nearby cook overhears and tosses his food. And that's where the book ends, on a cliffhanger. I mean, will Tiger Wong get his dinner? Well, no, probably not. Uh, but it is very indicative of what you could get in any Tony Wong comic. It's all about action, action, action. Tony Wong actually employed a number of assistants on his book, so it can be hard to tell who does exactly what. Uh, Tony Wong would only sort of credit himself. He got the idea of using sort of a vast array of assistants from Japanese author Takeo Saito's comic, or manga, Golgo 13. Tony actually went to jail for two years, starting in 1991, for forgery. He made a comic about it called Tiger in the Cage, but it's not available in English, unfortunately. When Tony Wong got out, he reestablished himself with a brand new company called Jade Dynasty. Uh, he's established multiple companies over the years, so even though he's the front man and the pitch man for his comics, a lot like Stan Lee, by all accounts, Tony Wong can actually draw and has a lot of talent. Uh, he's certainly a hard worker establishing these new companies over and over and cranking out comics 
over, over the years. I mean, the guy is almost 70 years old and he's still making comics. He started when he was 13. That's amazing. What a unique individual. By the way, this comic, Oriental Heroes, was turned into a live action uh, Hong Kong movie back in around, I think, 2006, starring Donnie Yen. Uh, it's called Dragon Tiger Gate, so you might be interested in that. Uh, anyway, I'm exhausted talking about all this. Uh, I think Tony Wong is a fascinating character. His comics are completely over the top and ridiculous, but that's part of the fun. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed this episode, and until next week, keep reading comics. Folks, thank you so much for watching. That'll do it for this week. Uh, please consider visiting my Patreon. Uh, I've got exclusive content there at certain tiers. I've got blog posts. We have polls for what kind of topic we'll do on episodes coming up. So there's a lot of stuff to do in that community. I'd appreciate you checking it out. Um, I have fan art this week. This comes to us from Ken Ives. He was the only one that submitted something this week, so he, by default, wins the Gachapon of the Week. We'll see what he gets here. Not looking. Uh, oh, very cool. This is sort of like a mini crossbow that you can build and shoot like uh, plastic uh, missiles. It, it's quite fun. I, I got one for myself. So I hope you uh, enjoy that, Ken. Thank you for the great artwork. If you're interested, uh, you know, send any fan art about the show to comictropes at gmail.com and uh, I will show everything that I receive. I will credit you. I will show your website or your social if you give it to me. And uh, everybody that enters has a chance to win the Gotcha Pond Prize of the Week. So, uh, anyway, appreciate you listening to me. Take care. Hong Kong has a healthy respect for its comic book history. Uh, I'm walking through Kowloon Park, and there are statues like Cloud from Storm Riders and uh, characters from uh, Kowloon Walled City. And if you look, they just go all the way down. This is beautiful, just beautiful. And of course, among all these characters, we have to have Tiger Wong the lead character from Oriental Heroes by uh, Wong Look Hong, Tony, Tony Wong. That's so cool. Look at this guy. He's huge.